Alrighty folks, in this video we're going to talk about the central limit theorem for proportions. Okay, so first of all, what's a proportion? A proportion is just a fancy way of saying a percentage of something. Um, but before we get into the central limit theorem, we have to talk about what's a sampling distribution. Specifically, the sampling distribution of a proportion um, is the distribution, right, which just means a histogram of something, um, so it's a distribution of all the values taking in the samples of all the samples from the population. So basically what we're saying is we're taking a bunch of samples from the population. In fact, we're taking all the samples we possibly can take from the population and we're calculating some value from those samples. For this particular video, we're going to be talking about taking sample proportions. So we'll be taking samples and we'll be calculating the proportion of something when, within each of those samples. And then once we have all of the, that data, right, from all, I'm talking about a bunch of samples, then we're able to look at a distribution, which is a collection of them. So consider this. All right, consider these histograms below, which represent the same sampling distributions, just with different sample sizes. So what I mean by that, imagine this. Imagine that we are interested in figuring out the proportion of, I don't know, let's say orange candies in a bag of candies, right? Um, let's say that we know that the manufacturer told us, hey man, there's 20% of, let's say, red candies in this bag of, in, in, in the world's, you know, bag of candies. So there should be a 20% um, proportion of, of red candies in the world. Well, what we're seeing here in these uh, histograms here is imagine we took all these different samples, right? A bunch of different samples. And the first histogram is showing you what if you took a sample of size 10. So you took a bunch of samples, but each time you sampled, you only took out 10 candies. And you recorded the percentage of, of um, uh, red candies, let's say. And so this first histogram is showing you what happens. Right. It's saying that, you know, we get one candy. Um, well, we get excuse me, we get three red candies about looks like about 10 percent of the time or five percent of the time, so on and so forth. The key thing that I want you to notice is for this first uh, distribution here, this first histogram, notice that right skewed distribution. Keep that in mind. So that was whenever we collected a sample of 10 candies. Now let's repeat the experiment, but this time we're taking a bunch of samples, thousands and thousands of samples, but this time, every time we do the experiment, we're going to collect 30 candies at a time. Well, now what have we started to notice? We started to notice that the shape is starting to change a little bit. In fact, jump down to this third one here. Look what happens when the sample size becomes really large. So once again, we're performing this experiment thousands and thousands of times, but this time we're taking samples of 100 candies. Notice that now the distribution becomes normal looking, right? And then if we take even more candies in our sample, let's say 1,000 candies, now it's definitely looking like a normal distribution, okay? So what you guys need to know from this is that's what a, the central limit theorem tells us, okay? So just a few quick notes. Notice what happens when the sample size increases. That's not the number of costs, that should be candies. The distribution becomes normal looking, all right? Which will allow us to perform some of the statistical analyses we've done in previous sections, mostly finding probabilities. So that concept is called the central limit theorem. It says that if certain conditions are met, then as your sample size increases, the sampling distribution will become approximately normal. Okay? So that, that's the heart of the central limit theorem. It says if your sample size is big enough, even if you start off with a skewed distribution, if your sample size is large enough, you're able to say, hey, I have a normal distribution and now I can do things like find probabilities. Okay. So if you recall, when it comes to finding a probability or when it comes to defining a normal distribution, there are two very important parameters. You have the mean and you have the standard deviation. Remember, the mean gives you the center of the normal distribution. The standard deviation gives you the width of the normal distribution. 
Well, it turns out that for sampling distributions of the proportion, that if the conditions are met for the central limit theorem, then the mean for the sampling distribution. So that's what this notation means here. Mu with the p hat, the hat is just a little thing that goes across the p, um, that is the mean of the sampling distribution. Okay. Matter of fact, that symbol P with the hat on it, it represents what we call a sample proportion. So remember we were collecting bags of candy? When I took out my sample of 100 candies and I figured out that 25% of those 100 candies are red, that 25% is my sample proportion, or what we call P hat. Um, so it turns out that the mean of the sampling distribution, let's go back to this, the norm, for the normal distribution, the mean of the sampling distribution is the same thing as P without a hat. What's P without a hat? P without a hat is your population proportion. So the sample proportion is the um, percentage, obviously, within just my sample. The population proportion is worldwide, all the candies in the world, what percent of those are, are red. So that's how we figure out the mean for this normal model of the sampling distribution. The standard deviation is going to be this formula here. It looks a little weird here. It's going to be uh, P times Q over N. And so just once again, what does sigma, sigma P hat represent? That is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. All right. And if you recall from our discussion, especially when we talked about binomial probabilities, P and Q should be familiar to you. So think of P as being like your success rate and think of Q as being your failure rate. So think of P as being your success rate and Q is the failure rate. So that's why um, that's why Q is 1 minus P, as we've seen before. And lastly, N is your sample size. Okay, N is your sample size. So remember when we saw those different histograms, the, the difference between all those histograms was the sample size. Okay, so lastly, before we actually get into some exercise here, is we have to understand what are the actual conditions that allow us to apply the central limit theorem. Once again, the central limit theorem says if these conditions are met, then you have the sampling distribution becomes a normal model with the mean equal to P and the standard deviation equal to P times Q over N, the square root of that. Okay, so here are the conditions. The conditions say this, we need to have independence. Okay, we need to have independence. Um, and so the way that you verify your independence assumption is that you, you really can't verify this independent. You just have to know that the scenario means that when I'm independent, it means that one, um, one outcome doesn't affect my next outcome, right? So when I'm flipping a coin, right? If I land on heads on the first flip, that doesn't affect me landing on heads on the second flip. That's independence. Okay. So if you, so we need an independence assumption. Now, one way you can go ahead and say that you are independent is if you have, um, if you collected your samples using random sampling. Random sampling will automatically lead to independence. Okay? So that's why there's like this randomization condition because that's going to help you verify independence. So the first thing we check for is is there any type of uh, randomization that will give us our independence check? Next, another way that kind of helps us determine independence is that we need to sample less than 10% of the population. Because if we start to sample too much of the population, we're going to get some kind of related um, individuals sampled. So our job is to make sure we sample less than 10% of the population. That will also help us ensure that we have independence. Okay? All right, and then the third and final condition is that we need to ensure that our sample size is large enough, okay? And how do we do that? We are going to check N times P, okay? 
Uh, so what that means is you take your sample size times your success rate, and we need that to be greater than or equal to two, 10. And we need n times q, or n times one minus p, we need that to be greater than or equal to 10. So basically what we're saying is when we take n times p, when we take our success rate multiplied by the number of people, that gives us the number of successes. And when we do n times q or n times one minus p, that gives us the number of failures. So what we're saying is that our sample size is big enough if the number of successes is bigger than 10 and the number of failures is more than 10. Okay, so those are the three conditions. Check your randomness, check uh, that you sampled less than 10% of the population, and then check your number of successes and number of failures. All right, let's get into some examples here. For example, in a large class of students, a professor asks uh, each student to toss a coin 25 times and calculate the, the proportion, uh, sorry about that, there's a typo there, the proportion of their tosses that landed on heads. So we're tossing a coin 25 times and we're trying to figure out, not figure out, but we're, trying, we're counting or we're calculating the proportion of heads out of those 25 tosses. So the first question here says, can we use the normal model for this scenario? Can we use the normal model for this scenario? Remember what we need to check. We need to check independence. Okay. So let's think about it. When we flip a coin, when we flip a coin, does that affect our next flip? Let's say we flip a coin, we land on heads. Does that have any bearing or any effect on our next flip? It does not. Because there's no effect amongst the, the, the trial, so to speak here, we do have independence, okay? So flipping a coin, independent events. All right, next, we need to check the 10% condition. Remember, we have to be less than 10%. We have to sample less than 10%. Well, we're flipping a coin, so our next check here is the 10% condition. Remember, we need to sample less than 10% uh, of the population. Well, this one, think about it. There's, uh, we could toss a coin an infinite amount of times, right? There's no limit to how many times we can toss a coin. So the fact that we're tossing it 25 times is certainly less than 10% of the possible amount of times that we could toss this. So the 10% condition is satisfied. All right, and then lastly, we need to check the success and failure condition. All right, so for that, we need to check N times P. We need to check N times Q, which I'm gonna write as one minus P. Well, first of all, what the heck is P for this? P is going to represent the proportion, the population proportion of getting ahead. Population proportion of heads. Well, anytime we flip a coin, there is a 50% chance we get heads, there's a 50% chance we get tails. So for us, P is equal to 50%. Okay? 0.50. All right. So now, what is, what's n? n is our sample size. For us, it's going to be how many times are we tossing that coin? We're tossing the coin 25 times. So 25, the number of times we flip the coin, that is our n, our sample size. All right, so now we're just gonna fill in our formula. So n will be 25 times p of 0.50. If we go to the calculator, uh, feel free to double check me, but you should get 12.5. And that will be, certainly 12.5 is greater than 10. So we are good on that front. And then we check N times one minus P. So 25 times one minus 0.50, which is also 0.50, right? That's gonna give us 12.5, we are greater than 10. So the success and failure condition is met. So can we use a normal model for this scenario? Yes, we can. All right, good. 
Moving on to part B. What is the mean and standard deviation for this sampling distribution model? And then they want us to draw the sampling distribution model. Well, the mean, which I'm going to use this notation, mean mu of p hat, the central limit theorem tells us if all the conditions are satisfied, this equals p. Well, what do we say p was? The proportion that we get, the proportion of all tosses that we get heads is 50%. So mu p hat equals 0.50. That's the mean. What's the standard deviation? Okay, well that was that weird formula. It's P times Q, which I'm going to write as 1 minus P, over N, and we take the square root of that entire thing. So what does that look like for us? Remember P is 0 0.50, so we do 0 0.50 times 1 minus 0 0.50. Divide that by our sample size of 25. Remember, tossing the coin 25 times, and then we take the square root of that entire thing. Let's put that in the calculator and let's get an answer to, let's say, three decimal places. So I'm going to do square root 0 0.50 times 1 minus 0 0.50. And all of this is underneath my square root still. Close my parentheses. Oops, that's the wrong one. Close my parentheses and then divide that, still underneath the square root, divide that by our sample size of 25. We work that out and we get a 0 0.1. So sigma p hat is 0 0.1. Okay, so we know the mean, we know the standard deviation, and we know that this is a normal model. So what does this look like? So drawing this should be really familiar to us. Um, we have, as we said, now a normal distribution. Okay which is, so uh, this is a measurement along the horizontal axis are all the sample proportions. Right down the middle is our mean, and that's going to be a 0 0.50. And then the width of this curve is, is going to be the, um, the standard deviation. So let's do this. One standard deviation to the left of our mean would be here at 0 0.4. So this is going to be our mean uh, minus one standard deviation. And then over here will be a 0 0.6. This is our mean plus one standard deviation. So remember our standard deviation is a 0 0.1, so that's how I'm getting these values. Okay, let's go out two standard deviations from the mean. Okay, so that means we add another 0.1, so that'll be a 0.7 is our mean plus two standard deviations. And then over here, it'll be a 0 0.3, that's the mean minus two of those standard deviations. And then lastly, let's go out three in each direction. Hopefully you know it's 0 0.2 and 0 0.8 respectively. The left is the mean minus three standard deviations. The right is the mean plus three standard deviations. Okay? So that is our normal model for the sampling distribution of proportions. Part C. Use the 68, 95, and 99.7 rule to describe the sampling distribution model. So if you guys remember, this rule says that 68% of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean, right? And then 95% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. And lastly, 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. Okay, well the good news is we already done the hard work, right? We've already figured out what it means to be within one, two, and three standard deviations, right? So if we go back to our, mod our picture of the model here, 
Within one standard deviation, what is that for us? That's between 0.4 and 0.6. So we can say that 68% of the data is between 0.4 and 0.6. So 68% of the data is between 0.4 and 0.6. Okay, 95% of the data is within two standard deviations. Okay, what is it within two? It's going to be between 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. So 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. And then lastly, 99% of... 0.7% of the data is between these two values, a 0 0.2 and a 0 0.8. Okay? So this is just basically a word version of, of our picture that we did in part B. All right. I think I have one last example, guys. Okay. So it is estimated that 12% of the world's population is left-handed. What's the probability that in a large classroom of 150 students, there are more than 25 left-handed students? Okay. All right. So really quick, they don't ask us to, but let's check our conditions. Okay. Check our conditions. First of all, do we have any type of uh, independence? Okay. Well, we can assume here, and that's what that's the, that's the deal with some of these questions, folks. It's like you can't really, sometimes you just have to make an assumption. We can assume here that, uh, first of all, that uh, it is a bit random, right? Because we're talking about the population are all people in the world, right? So people sitting in this classroom, that's a reasonable assumption to make that that's pretty random to have uh, people sitting in that classroom, okay? And also, we can make the assumption that these students aren't really related to each other. There's a low probability likelihood that the students are related to each other, okay? So because of that, we can say, yes, the independence assumption is satisfied. Okay, so once again, sometimes you just have to make that assumption that the independence is satisfied, okay? All right, what about the 10% condition? Well, this one is certainly true, right? Because uh, 150 students is certainly less than 10% of the world's population. So the 10% condition is satisfied, okay? And then thirdly, do we have our number of successes and failures? Well, let's look at this. 12% of the world is left-handed. So that means that our P, our proportion, is 0.12. And let's go here. What is the probability in a large classroom of 150 students? Our sample size is 150 students. So basically, we need more than 10 left-handed students and more than 10 students that are not left-handed. To check that, we do N times P, which for us, for us will equal 150 times 0.12, so let's see what that equals. 150 times 0.12 gives us 18. Okay, and 18 is certainly bigger than 10, so we're in business. And certainly n times one minus p, the number of non-left-handers, that's certainly gonna be way bigger than 10. So um, that's gonna be one minus 0.12 Let's get the number for that. In fact, that number is going to be, if I take 150 minus uh, 18, that should be 132. If my math is correct, let's double check that. So we'll do 150 times 1 minus uh, 0.12, 132. All right, which is greater than 10. So the, the successes and failure condition all checks out. Everything works out. So this will be approximated this can be approximated by a normal model, okay? 
So we have, let's write down our information. We have a normal model where the mean, and this just means the mean of this sampling distribution, is P, which we know is 12% of all people are left-handed, so 0.12. And then our standard deviation of our sampling distribution will be P times 1 minus P over N square root. Okay, which will be 0.12 times 1 minus 0.12. Our sample size was 150 students in the class. Square root it. So let me clear this out. So we do square root 0 0.12 parentheses 1 minus 0 0.12. So we're going to multiply there. And we're going to divide all underneath the square root, the radical, by 150. And to let's go, uh, I don't know, let's go three decimal places of 0 0.027. So sigma p hat is 0 0.027. Okay, so we have all the information we need to find this probability. What's the probability in a large classroom of 150 students, there are more than 25 left handed students? Okay. We've talked about this before in previous lectures. P means probability. We're trying to figure out that what's the probability that in our sample, that our sample proportion, right? Because we're talking about 150 students, the sample, that more, that more than 25 are left-handed. Okay. First of all, I'm going to say this is incorrect. Incorrect. This is incorrect because we are dealing with proportions or percentages. So the correct way to think about this is that this needs to be 25 students out of 150. We're trying to figure out what's the probability that our sample proportion is more than 25 out of 150. All right. Well, how do we do this? Well, all we have to do, folks, is go to... Uh, our calculator and then or go to stat crunch and we can use the normal calculator all right but in case you don't want to use a normal calculator I'm gonna show you what you could do you could use your Z tables and if you wanted to so let's make a note here this is optional if you wanted to your Z score would be let me write the formula for you it would be P hat minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Okay, so it would be whatever 25 out of 150 is, minus, remember our mean was 0.12, divided by um, 0 0.027. Okay? And then from there you get a z-score of, so let's do that, Let's do 25 divided by 150 minus 0 0.12, close parentheses, and then divide that by 0 0.027. We get a z-score of, let's go two decimal places, of 1.73. So then our problem becomes the probability that z is greater than a 1.73. So what we did here is we converted that 25 out of, out of 150, we converted it to its z-score. And now at this point you can use either technology or you can use um, your your z-tables if you're comfortable using those. But let me finish this using technology. So I'm gonna go to StatCrunch. So I'm going to hit stat Go to calculators and go to normal. All right. Hope you guys can see this okay. Um, I want to do my mean is zero. So remember, we have z scores. So remember, for z scores, the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. And I want to be, let's see, greater than 1.73. So I'm going to change my inequality to a greater than. Scribble this out. I'm going to put in a one. 
let's calculate that and good we get up to three decimal places we get a 0 0.042 All right, let's say I didn't want to convert that to a z-score. That's perfectly fine. What you also could have done is you could have come up to our earlier work here, and we could have also used um, the uh, stat calculator, right? The, the normal distribution calculator. And I'm going to show you how to do that from this part right here. So what you do is you go, and now the mean is going to be different. The mean is going to be the 0 0.12, right? And then our standard deviation, if you recall, that was a 0 0.027. Okay. Yeah, it might be easier to do this. 0 0.027. All right. And then our x here, we want to be greater than you're going to type in that 12 or that 25 divided by 150. Okay. And then we compute. And there we go. We get the exact same answer 0 0.042. All right. So those are a couple ways that you can go about getting that answer, okay? It's completely up to you which way you prefer. All right. The professor of the course thinks that having 25 left-handed students in the course is an unusually high amount. Is the professor correct? Okay. So for this, um, we need to figure out, actually, we need to figure out the z-score, which we've already done. Okay. And then that will tell us. So I'm just going to re- recalculate the z-score. So the z-score for a sampling distribution will be your sample proportion minus your mean over your standard deviation. Okay? So remember for p hat for us is going to be 25 divided by the total number of students in the course and the sample which is 150. And then from the central limit theorem, we know that the mean is 0.12. And we've already done the calculations, and we saw that the standard deviation was a 0 0.027. So the z-score would be 25 over 150 minus the mean of 0 0.12 divided by 0 0.027. And as we saw earlier, we got a z-score of... 1.73, positive 1.73, okay? So if you guys recall, a z-score of 1.73 indicates that the data value is not that unusual. Remember, we were looking for more than three standard deviations away from the mean is highly unusual. So the 1.73 is the z-score tells us we're only uh, 25 and 25 students is only 1.73 standard deviations away. That's not all that unusual. So is the professor correct in thinking having 25 students is unusual? The professor is incorrect. Since um, the z-score is a 1.73 and it's not anything like a three or a negative four, four or anything like that, okay? So once again, highly unusual means more than three standard deviations away. That means that your z-score is either bigger than three or smaller than a negative three. All right, y'all, I know that was a long one, but I hope that uh, gets you guys set on the right path about sampling distributions.